Thank you, guys. It's so nice to be here in Helsinki, and it's slush. I want to thank Harry, our driver, who picked us up at the airport. That was awesome. And Samir, our concierge, who's been showing us all around. Been fantastic. But, um, you know, things are not so good at home in the States. My, uh, my mom is really quite pissed off at me for using this title for my talk. And I said, Mom, it's just to get their attention. It's not really to make fun of them or abuse them or anything. But she doesn't really believe me. So I need you guys to do me a favor. If you get anything out of the next 15 minutes, I mean anything, I want you to please email my mom, OK? This is her email address, mom at founder.org. And just tell her, like, it wasn't that bad, OK? I wasn't really too insulted. And I know she's going to appreciate it. So how many of you here are working on building a startup right now? Raise your hands. OK. How many of you think that the world gives a shit about what you're doing? OK. Well, I guess I can leave now, because you get the point. Let's do the math. One in 700 startups that an investor talks to gets funded. That's not that many, right? One. And of those startups that get funded by an investor, about 1,400 of those will end up being billion-dollar companies. So what does that mean to you? You have a 0.0001% chance of being a unicorn. That's exciting, right? That's why we're all doing this, because we have such a great chance. In fact, one in 997,500 startups will be unicorns. So for me, my experience was a little bit different. Um, a couple of the six companies I started ended up being unicorns. And so I was thinking to myself, why don't more startups become great companies? And I'm not talking about these billion-dollar rounds that get done and then the companies go out of business. I'm talking about companies that reach a billion dollars in market value and stay there, sustainable companies. So I started thinking about, well, what have I learned in doing this? And that's what I want to share with you a little bit. How can you be the one in a million startup that becomes a unicorn? Does that sound good? All right. So here's a couple of things that I've learned I want to share with you. Lesson number one, you got to start with a big idea. You cannot build a big company if you're focused on solving a small problem. And in startup land today, all over the world, we have too many small ideas. If you want to build a billion-dollar company, you've got to solve a $10 billion problem. If you want to build a $10 billion company, you've got to solve a $100 billion problem. So when I used to pitch my last company, Splunk, um, this is actually the slide that I used in my Series A presentation. And I could have had a one-slide presentation because this made the point. We were solving, and this is back from 2004, a multi-hundred billion dollar problem. In 2004, the world spent $300 billion managing their IT infrastructure. That means labor cost. And that number was growing at 2x a year, three times the cost of hardware or infrastructure assets. This was a big problem. And it was very easy for investors to understand that we were going after a big market. So when you have a truly disruptive innovation like we did, you can get 10 to 20% of the spend in that market over the life of your company. So don't tell an investor that you're solving a $100 billion problem and you're going to do $100 billion in revenue someday. It doesn't work that way. Companies, consumers will spend about 10% of the savings that they get on your solution. So in our case, 
customers would spend about $30 billion of that 300 to solve the problem. They'd take the other money and they'd put it in their pocket and save it. So that means that Splunk could be somewhere between a three and a six billion dollar company in terms of revenues. Most companies in the software space trade at about five times revenues. So it could be a pretty big company and investors could do that math. That's what you have to do. Okay, so lesson number one. Solve a big problem if you want to build a big company. Lesson number two, you have to have the right DNA on your team. We hear this over and over again, right? Startups are all about people, people, people. Team, team, team. It's true. Every one of my six companies faced certain death at some point in time, and it was only because of the strength of the team that we made changes, figured things out, and moved forward. And so investors always want to invest in great people. The problem is most startups wait far too long to build the right DNA in their company. In fact, I would say 99% of startups wait too long to build a balanced team. So of the, the people that raise your hands out there that are starting companies, how many of you have a sales leader in your company today? Show of hands. Yeah, there's about 10 hands going up, right? Every startup I have ever worked with or worked at has waited too long to bring in sales DNA into the company. If you have a prototype today that you're showing to customers, hire some sales DNA into your company. Salespeople have a different DNA. And I think someday, some of these people we saw up here in life sciences are going to figure out the biomarkers and gene sequence for salespeople. Because I believe they are wired so differently than the rest of us who are engineers and product creators. They can look a customer in the eye when they only have a crappy prototype and ask them for an outrageous amount of money. It's amazing. I could never do that. As an engineer, as a CEO, I could never do that. You need these people in your company. You will not hear the honest objections that customers have unless you have someone with this kind of DNA asking them for their wallet. So it is never too early to bring sales DNA into your company. OK, lesson number three. You've got to tell a powerful story. Most of the startup teams that we work with come to us and they are telling the wrong story. They might have a great innovation, they might have a great team, but they're not telling the right story. So let me give you an example of this. This is a company called Smart Vision Labs. They joined Founder.org out of NYU in New York. And Smart Vision invented an attachment for the iPhone and some really smart software that allows a five-year-old to take a picture of somebody's eyes and give you an eyeglass and contact lens prescription on the spot from an iPhone. So easy to use, a five-year-old can do it. Now, when they started working with us three years ago, they were out to replace this, which is called the Foropter. The Foropter is the main staple of every eye doctor in the world. Why did they want to replace this? Well, the smartphone with their attachment and software is smaller, it's cheaper, it's easier, and it's actually more accurate because it uses digital refractive indexing it's completely non-subjective. I'm sure you've all sat in front of one of these four opters, and the doctor flips the lenses back and forth and says, better, worse, good, best, right? And you're driving your car at night, and you're squinting and going, God, I should have picked the other one, right? I hate that. You don't have that problem with the smart vision device. The problem is, 
The ophthalmologists didn't want to buy their device. They, the ophthalmology industry has invested billions of dollars in four opters, in the hardware, in the training, and they don't want to give it up. This company was going after the wrong customer, telling the wrong story. What they figured out in working with us for a while is that there were much better markets for them. What's great about their device? It's portable. It can be used by a five-year-old. It requires zero training. So they can take this into markets like schools in the United States, where we have a requirement to check every kid's vision until they're 12 years old. They can take it into markets like Haiti and Guatemala, where you don't have ophthalmologists in these countries to service the population, and you have literally half the population of Haiti walking around without corrected vision. Imagine the impact on GDP in a country like that if you could correct vision out in the field. And this is what they're doing today. Much better market for them. They're telling the right story now, and they're off to the races growing the company. Okay, so these are the three lessons. Start by solving a big problem. Make sure you build the right DNA on your team. Don't have a team of 10 engineers. Don't have a team of five marketing people. Build a holistic, well-rounded team. And then finally, make sure you're telling a powerful story. You tell stories all day long in a startup. When you're hiring employees, when you're talking to investors, when you're working early with customers, you're always telling a story. This is where the unicorns sit, in the middle of these three things. The companies that grow to be billion-dollar companies understand these three things early on, and they do them very well. So, if you want to learn more about this, I want to invite you uh, this evening. We have an event at 6 o'clock, and we have two awesome companies that are going to share their journey of how they have done this with you. Uh, one of these companies, ISI, just announced today that they closed their Series A funding round uh, with True Ventures, uh, ourselves, and Lifeline Ventures. They are reinventing, from Helsinki, by the way, this is a company from Alto University, just around the corner. They are reinventing the way that we monitor the planet Earth by launching a low-orbit, small footprint set of satellites that use radar to image the Earth from space. They can see through clouds. They can see at night. It's an amazing, amazing advance that they're making in the way we look at the planet. And Rafael uh, will be there, the CEO and the key inventor of the technology, to talk about his journey. And the other person that will be there is Pascal. Uh, Pascal is with a company called UNU out of Berlin. And this company has invented a new electric scooter. You might have seen it running around the show floor here. Um, this, we believe, is really going to revolutionize the whole way we get around cities. Um, the whole idea of having fast transportation that can guide you anywhere you want to go, suggest things that you could do today and take you there. Um, all electric, completely quiet, requires no charging network because it has a small battery. You pull right out from under the seat and take into your office or into your apartment and charge it, just plug it into the wall. Really amazing product. So they're both going to be presenting, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about how do you architect a powerful story so that you can alter the future and take your customer, your investor, to a place that they never imagined. This is the only way to get people's attention today. The typical customer today, your customer, is bombarded by over 5,000 marketing messages a day. So you need to really tell them you're going to take them someplace special if you're going to break through all that noise and they're going to take a chance on you and your startup. So I hope you'll consider joining us at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have some food, some drinks, and hear from these two great companies about their journey so far. Thank you all for being here at Slush, and thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it.